With this tutorial, I want to show a quick rundown of the basic Photoshop tools and how you would use them for video game development. Our later chapters will go into much more detail about specific tools, but this is intended as a quick primer for students that are just starting out. First things first, let's go to the File tab here and create a new image. Now change the file size to 1024 pixels by 1024 pixels. Make sure that it's set to pixels, otherwise you will have a 1024 inch file and your computer might explode. With video game textures, it's important to have them in powers of two so that the video game engines can properly compress and store them. Currently, the most common texture sizes are 512 by 512, 1024 by 1024, and 2048 by 2048. These will continue to increase as video cards increase their video memory, but these sizes will be safe to use for now. Now that we have a new image created, let's open up some texture reference. All of these were downloaded from cgtextures.com, and I highly recommend this site for texture reference. I'm going to create a grass texture to start with. This one looks like it'll be a good starting point because the lighting is even and not direction specific. When choosing good texture source material, you want to avoid images with harsh shadows and visible reflections or highlights because you want the game engine's lighting to handle those details instead. Now that we have two windows open here, I want to talk about the different full screen modes. You can select the image you want to work on by selecting the top of the window and then press F and it will toggle through multiple full screen modes. This comes in very handy when you want to isolate a certain image and hide the surrounding clutter. Pressing tab will also toggle on and off the UI which is nice to use once you're comfortable with the hotkeys. Let's press F until we get back to windowed mode and select our grass file. Now press Ctrl A to select all and then Ctrl C to copy this image. Next, click on the new image we created and press Ctrl V to paste it in. OK, let's press F to go back into full screen mode so that we can focus on this texture. Here you should see a Layers tab on the right side, and if it's not visible, just hit F7 to bring it back up. You'll notice that we have two layers, our background layer and the new grass layer. We can double click the name here to rename it to something specific like Grass Diffuse. Eventually you'll have multiple layers and you can click the eyeball to turn a layer's visibility on and off. You can also drag a layer's opacity here to lower its transparency. Next, press Ctrl T to bring up the Transform Lattice. This is a very important tool that lets you move, rotate, scale, and skew your image. To move, you simply click anywhere within the border and drag it around like this. To rotate, move your cursor anywhere outside of the transform border and then click and drag. If you hold shift, it will rotate in 15 degree increments. To scale or change the size of the image, just drag the corners of the border. Holding shift while you do this will maintain the proportions of the image, which is usually recommended unless you are okay with a slight amount of distortion. Lastly, if you hold control while moving the corners, it will skew the image, which can come in handy if you're trying to fix perspective or get a specific angle or distortion. Now I'm going to use Transform to move and scale this grass piece, and I'm specifically looking for the best area of the source image to use. Since this texture is going to repeat many times on the ground, I want to avoid any large contrast details or recognizable patterns. Things like a large rock, a dead patch of grass, or a big stick would be examples of things to avoid. Okay, I'm happy with this general region, so now I want to crop out the remaining image so that all that we are left with are the pixels that are visible in the image boundaries. Otherwise, these outside pixels will still be there, which will introduce problems when we try to make this a tiling or repeatable texture later on in the tutorial. To do this, press Ctrl A to select all of your workspace, and then go to the Image drop-down and choose Crop. This will delete all of the surrounding pixels of your image that you can't see. Now before we start actually editing these pixels, let's go over some handy tools and shortcuts that we will use throughout the tutorial. First, a couple quick tools for viewing and navigating your image. Z will switch to the zoom tool and by default left click will zoom in and alt left click will zoom out. Notice the zoom level on the top of your image. This will let you know what percentage of the image you are looking at. While you are zoomed in or in full screen mode, holding spacebar and dragging will pan your canvas around which helps you navigate. Alternatively, you can press control plus or minus to zoom in and out. V or the move tool lets you move a layer or selection around. M for the marquee tool lets you make either rectangular or elliptical selections to the active layer. 
L or the lasso tool lets you select a specific region from your layer by clicking and outlining the shape. I also use the polygonal lasso to make a more precise selection. To use this, simply click and hold the lasso icon and it will drop down so that you can select the polygonal lasso variant. Most tools have variants of themselves that you can select in the same manner. You can refine any selection by holding Shift to add or Alt to subtract, like so. Another really useful selection tool is the magic wand. This selects areas of similar color and value based on a tolerance level that you can set here. I recommend using 14 at the start and raising or lowering it depending on your needs. It can be really useful to isolate a specific detail. For instance, if I want to select all of these little white rocks in the grass, I can select a few different shades of them by holding shift to add them to the total selection. Then I simply go to the select menu and choose similar. Once I have this selection, I can use the healing brush here to automatically paint over the selection which will remove the white rocks. Now, let's create a new layer by pressing Ctrl Shift N, or you can press this button here. I'm going to name this Brush Tester, and then I'll press the B key to switch to my brush tool. Now right click to bring up your brush quick pick menu. Eventually you'll have hundreds of brushes like this, but even then you'll only use some of your favorites. Practice making strokes and get a feel for the different types available. Press the bracket keys to increase or decrease your brush size. As I paint, I'm constantly changing brush sizes and also using the Alt key to color sample areas of the canvas. If you want to pick a specific color, you can always click here to bring up your color picker and slide it around to get the exact hue, saturation, and value that you desire. In some cases, you might need to enter a specific RGB value, so you can do that here as well. Also, if you're using a mouse rather than a tablet, you can use the number keys to change opacity levels on 10% increments. For example, 1 would be 10%, 5, 50%, and 0 would be 100%. I use a Wacom tablet to control my opacity based on pen pressure. I recommend watching our brush creation chapter later for specifics on how to make these individual brushes. Now that we have some basic brush strokes on this layer, let's take a look at a couple different layer blending modes. First select normal here and then use the up and down arrow keys to quickly cycle through all the different layer modes. For texturing, my favorites are multiply, overlay, soft light, and linear dodge. Multiply will only go darker than your current image and it blends with whatever layers are behind it. It can be useful for adding subtle shadows or cracks. Overlay splits the values down the middle, so any colors above a neutral value will brighten while any values below will darken. This is very useful for adding slight color variations or grime to a texture, like so. Soft light does the same thing, but is much more subtle. I use Linear Dodge for natural looking highlights or edge wear, but you need to be careful not to overdo it. Keep in mind, since all of these effects are attached directly to the layer, you can always adjust the layer opacity to lessen the effect. I encourage you to play around with all these modes and get a better understanding of how they work. They're also very useful if you're interested in digital painting. Now let's look at the Eraser tool. Press E to select it and then right click to pick the brush shape again. Notice these are the same brushes as before, so eventually you'll have certain brushes that you prefer for painting and others for erasing. Perhaps the most useful tool for texturing is the clone stamp brush. Press S to select it and make sure it's set to clone stamp here rather than pattern stamp. Now clone stamp uses the brush library, but instead of painting with a solid color, it paints with pixels that you sample from a target. Now to select the sample target, just hold Alt and click an area that you'd like to replicate somewhere else. Then move your cursor to another area and start painting. Notice that it is painting a clone from where I targeted with Alt. Now I'm using Photoshop CS6, so I get a nifty little preview of my clone area. I think this feature was added in CS5, but if you're using previous versions of Photoshop, don't worry, the functionality remains the same. By default, you need to have the layer selected that you're sampling from, but I recommend changing it to sample all layers here. Now I can have an empty layer selected on top and sample from the layers below. This is much safer because it ensures that I'm not permanently cloning over important details. For instance, if I clone too much on this layer, then I can switch to the eraser and cut it back. Another important set of features within the clone brush can be found in the clone source window. You can bring that window up by clicking this button on the top menu. Since we will eventually be repeating this texture many times, we wouldn't always want to clone details around in the same fashion or orientation. 
This menu gives us options to rotate and flip the horizontal and vertical axis of our clone source. For instance, if I want to clone this patch of flowers around, I'd probably want them flipped and rotated 90 degrees so it's not as noticeable that they're repeating. I can also scale them down slightly here to get even more variety. Just remember to reset these settings if you need to do an exact clone later. Now the reason this is so useful for game texturing is because it helps us make tiling textures or repeatable patterns easier. Think of tiling textures as a wallpaper design that needs to repeat endlessly and seamlessly. In video games, when you want to cover large surfaces with a texture, like the grass terrain of your level, you need to make the texture tileable so that the texture size can remain small and the details achieved from how many times you repeat the texture. Here is an example of a 1024 by 1024 sand texture that has not been tiled in Photoshop. It looks fine right now, but once we increase our tiling amount in 3ds Max to something like 5x5, it becomes very obvious where the texture seams are. Here is the same texture after fixing some of the issues in Photoshop, and here it is again tiled 5 times. Now for an exaggerated example, let's look at this 128 by 128 sand texture. If we want the 128 pixel texture to have as much detail as the 1024, we would need to repeat it many more times in our material. Up close, the detail is comparable, but further away it doesn't have nearly as much interest because I had to remove most distinguishable features. It's a really good exercise to see how low you can drop down a texture and still have it work for you. This is especially important if you're working on mobile games or web games where your download size is limited. Now that we've seen some practical examples, let's tile the grass that we started with earlier. First, let's do a quick and dirty clone job. This is the technique I use when I want to apply some placeholder textures to an object quickly. To start, just duplicate this layer by selecting it and pressing Ctrl J. Now let's go to the Filter menu, choose Other, and select Offset. Since our texture is a 1024, we can offset it by 512 in both the horizontal and vertical fields. Now what that does is it takes the pixels that used to be on the border and it offsets them so that they form a cross in the center and the pixels that used to be in the center are now on the border. From here, we can use the clone brush to sample and paint out the seam, like so. Once you are done, you can offset it again by 512 to make sure you didn't introduce any new seams with your cloning. From here, I like to test the texture out in Crazy Bump. First I'll select the tiled layer and then press Ctrl A and Ctrl C to copy it into my clipboard. Crazy Bump is a simple program that creates multiple game textures from a single input texture. In this case I'm just going to open it up and choose the Paste Photograph from Clipboard option. It will ask you to select Shape so go ahead and choose the left one. Now we're going to just use this program for its previewing functions. I recommend watching our Crazy Bump tutorial after this for a better understanding of what this cool program can do. If a 3D preview doesn't show up, go ahead and click this button here and then change your preview shape to a box so that we get a clean, flat look at the texture. Next click the Options box and make sure that only the diffuse is checked. This way we can evaluate the single texture without any other distractions. Also select the intensity of the normal map and change it to zero to provide a cleaner evaluation of the texture. Now you can rotate the box around by left click and dragging the window and changing the light location by right click and dragging. The best feature here though is the ability to increase and decrease the tiling amount by using the plus and minus keys. Let's press plus a couple times and we'll start to notice a few elements that stick out too much. From here we can identify the worst offenders and jump back into Photoshop and clone over them like this. Once you fix an area, keep jumping back to Crazy Bump to test it. So, here's mine after fixing a few of the worst cases. It looks okay, and probably good enough for most cases, but notice that I'm losing a lot of crispness from over cloning. A common problem I notice with people's tiling textures is that you can actually see the clone line they covered up because it looks slightly blurrier than the rest of the image. It's especially noticeable when repeating many times. This next technique is a little more technical, but I think it provides much better results. To start, let's go back to the beginning right after you've cropped your image. Next, duplicate the grass layer and offset the bottom layer by 512. Now turn off the top layer so that you can see the cross seam in the center. Press Ctrl Shift N to create a new layer and drag it in between the original grass and its copy. Next, press B to select your brush and paint using a bright noticeable color like orange to cover up the seams. 
Be careful not to paint directly up to the edges because those areas will create seams again. Once you have a basic shape like this, you can hold Alt in between the two layers to create a clipping mask. This means the top layer will only show through the painted areas here, so you can add or subtract grass just by using the brush or eraser. I find it a lot easier to cover the seams while still retaining the crispness of the texture with this technique. You can also flip and rotate the top layer to further reduce repetition. This is the same basic principle as we used on our clone source options earlier. Once I have something that looks good, I can create a new layer and use the ultimate shortcut, Control alt shift e to create a flattened copy of everything that is visible. From here I'll offset it again, but I can offset at random amounts to see if there are any seams left. Once I'm happy with it, I'll copy and paste it into Crazy Bump again and address any last tiling problems. Okay, here's my final grass texture, and I'm pretty happy with the results here. I think with this technique, there's a little more crispness, so it was worth taking a little extra time to get it right. Next, I want to go to Save As and name this Grass Diffuse, and save it as a Cry Tiff if I intend on using it for CryEngine, or a Targa if I intend on using it for UDK. Tiffs and Targas are commonly used for video games because they are lossless, meaning they aren't losing any quality upon saves. If saved as a 32-bit texture, they also can store one alpha channel that can be used to store an additional texture such as a transparency mask, specular map, or gloss map. The last thing I want to do is save my working file as a PSD so we can open this up with all the layers and keep editing it later on. Well, that wraps up our basic Photoshop for video games tutorial. Make sure to check out our other specific Photoshop tutorials 